Good morning. My name is Spencer. I'm one of the pastors here. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. So this is my last week uh, before I go on sabbatical for the next two months. And yeah, I'm excited. Uh, the, we did, someone uh, wiser than us recommended this a few years ago. They said that your pastors should go on sabbatical sooner uh, than you think, and it'd be good for your soul. And we've done this the last couple of years. Uh, Raz has been up going on sabbatical. Chet's been able to go on sabbatical. And uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to take two months just to really unplug, um, to focus on my relationship with Jesus, to, to be filled up in him, and to do some things that are good for my soul. Um, and we're going to be traveling a little bit. Uh, you will not see me here on Sundays. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take the opportunity for the next two months and uh, I've got some different friends who are pastors in the city. I'm going to go visit their churches, some other churches that I've been wanting to visit for quite some time to just learn and be filled up. So I'm looking forward to that. I'll still be with my community group, so they'll see me on a regular basis, uh, and, but I won't be here on Sundays. But I'm thankful that I get to do this. And, uh, and it's funny, I, I, I'm going to enjoy the time that I have to be able to do this. And I know by the end of June, I know I'm going to be ready to be back. Um, I so deeply love this church. Um, I love this people. I love you deeply. Um, you know, I, I have different friends around the country that, from my time in seminary that are pastoring in different cities and doing different things, different churches. And, and uh, when I catch up with them sometimes, it's, uh, you know, the pastoring's hard. It's just the calling. But their situations are, are harder um, and they're more difficult. And, uh, and I hear that, and there's this awkward moment every now and then that they say, well, how are you doing, and how's your church doing? And I'm like, man, I mean, it's, I mean, we're really blessed, and, and God's really been good to us, and, and people are, are growing and loving Christ, and it's just, you know, and it's just, I, I, I just have good news to report, and certainly we're sinners, and certainly we have our mess, and certainly we have our things that we walk through that are difficult. Um, but I think God's been uniquely kind to us in some powerful ways, uh, and it's been really uh, a privilege and a joy to pastor. So I will be looking forward and enjoying the time that I have away, but I know that I'll be ready to get back at the end of June because I do deeply love you guys. Um, we're in Philippians 3, um, so you can go ahead and flip there. It's on page 571 in your blue Bibles, and you can follow along there. The text will also be on the screen. A few weekends ago, uh, we had a, uh, a baseball tournament. My son's been playing uh, rookie ball, uh, which is a league, six, five and six year old playing baseball. And, uh, and our, we've been winning every game in our league that we're playing in. And our uh, head coach was like, let's try a tournament uh, so that we can kind of get the kids a little more, little, some, some teams that are, that are also really good uh, that we can play and just kind of see how they're doing. Uh, against some some better talent and some better uh, some older kids, and so we we played in this tournament and it was a lot of fun and and got to see them challenged in a lot of new ways, which is really fun as as a dad and a coach, uh, and I got to see the kids really fall in love with the game even more. But we made it to the championship game at that Sunday night, and uh, and before the game started, uh, they had trophies out, and. The kids got to see the trophy that they were playing for that was half the size of their little bodies. I mean, these were massive trophies. And they're like, are we, are, is that what we're going to get if we win? And it's like, yeah. Yeah, if you, you win first, like that, you, you're going to take home one of those. And they came alive. I mean, they were amped. I saw a level of desire and passion and effort that I hadn't seen all season long. I was amped up because I looked at across the other team and I got to see uh, who one of their coaches was and it was our very own Raz Bradley. Uh, Nate was on the other side, so I'm amped up. I'm like, let's do this. Like this was a really fun thing, but it was just fun to see those kids just come alive when they saw those trophies, when they saw the prize that they were competing for. And it was a vivid picture of just seeing the prize and just saying, I'm, and, and going all out for it, which is just, it's a general sports thing. You know, you see the prize, you play 
wholeheartedly for it. And that is the very metaphor that Paul uses in this passage today to describe the effort that we are called to put in to pursuing Christ and the eternal prize of life with him. And it's just a few verses that picture that. So I just want to take some time. I want to quickly walk through these verses. And then I want to help see three different things that uh, should help shape us as Christians as we focus on the eternal prize of life with God forever. So let me pray and then we'll walk through this together. Heavenly Father, I, help, I pray that you would help us see you as glorious, as worthy of our faith and worship in a way that would change the way that we live the Christian life. That means for some that it's going to be, for the first time, seeing you for who you are and surrendering to you in faith. For all of us, it's going to be faith and repentance and pursuing you because you are worthy of our worship and everything that we can put into this life. So God, help us see that this morning, and help us be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so before we get to verse 12, I want to provide some context that we were in last week in the previous verses. Part of the way through 8, it says, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. That what Chet was helping us see last week is that Paul was presenting this resume that he had, this Jewish resume amongst a bunch of uh, uh, Jewish people that were trying to enforce Jewish law back onto Christians. And he was saying, you don't understand. I was it. I was a Pharisee. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was the tribe of Benjamin. I was zealous. I was all these things. I had this, this holy, righteous resume. And he says, I count that as rubbish. That's garbage. That's filth. He says, that doesn't matter. He says, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And what he's teaching there is that the heart of the gospel is that we cannot, in our own effort, in our own good works, do anything to gain the favor of God. That if you think you can gain the favor of God by your good works, you misunderstand the gospel. Your good works are rubbish. The only good work that matters is Christ and the perfect righteousness of Christ that we gain through placing our faith in him. That's the only hope we have as Christians, is Christ and Christ alone. And he makes that point going into verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. He said the gospel saves us so that the end goal, we might one day be with him. And the resurrection, the end goal being the new heavens, the new earth, and the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Christians who come alive and are made completely new in glorified bodies in the new heavens, the new earth, where we get to finally and fully and wonderfully know God. That's it. That's the end goal. And that's the context that sets up verse 12, not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He says, I haven't gotten there yet. We're not perfected yet. We're not there in the resurrection with fully perfected bodies. We're not there yet. I press on to make it my own. Why? Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Because Christ claims us and saves us and sets us apart towards life with him forever. He said, we're working that way, but we're not there yet. In verse 13, he says, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. Just drills the point even further. We're not perfect. We're not there yet. It's what awaits us, but we're not there yet. He's not under the delusion that in his mature state, even then, as he's writing this, that he's he's arrived. No, he's not there yet. No. I have uh, some, some family uh, members who 
I used to wait tables for a family that owned this restaurant, and this family is one of the rare, you don't see these people much anymore, but they're called Christian perfectionists. And uh, they believe that in this life now, you can actually arrive at perfection, which is a rare heresy at this point. It doesn't really, you don't see it that much anymore. But can you imagine working and waiting tables for a people that don't ever make mistakes? They don't have sin. So if there's ever a problem, you know whose fault it is. It's certainly not theirs. What a miserable existence for everyone else and themselves because they don't know who Christ is. It's like that's delusional. Paul's like, no, we're not perfected yet. We're not there yet. We have not arrived. And he continues, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And Paul says, let me let you in a little bit of secret here. This is what I do. I forget the past. I strain forward. I press forward towards eternity. And I make every effort going in that direction, towards the upward call of God. I forget the past. I'm focused here. And I just keep going. And then he finishes his thought in verse 15 and 16. He says, and those of us who are mature think this way. And if, any, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this, that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. So Paul says, do you, do you want maturity? Do you want to press into maturity? This is it. And then he gives something that may be confusing at first when he says, if you think otherwise, what he's getting at there is not if you believe a different gospel. He's very clear about that in other places. If you believe a gospel different than the one that I'm preaching, you let him be accursed. It's like, if you're going to preach this, no, no, no. He's not talking about a different gospel. This is matters of conscience and approach to the Christian life. So if you have a little bit of a difference in conscience here, then God will reveal it to you. But the main thing, let us hold true to what we have attained. Let us press forward into the eternity that awaits us. So that's his argument in this passage. We get a window into how Paul views himself, that in his maturity he understands that this is where we're going, but we have not arrived yet. That it, he, he's, in his maturity, he sees his own sin. And that's true of wise, mature Christians. Wise, mature Christians know that they are sinful. They, it's apparent. And all the mistakes that have been made. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. I saw Paul later in 1 Timothy. He, says, he calls himself the chief of sinners. And it's like, the, the chief of sinners? You mean the, the, the number one sinner? Really, Paul? And it's like, no, he's just so tapped into his, he understands his sinfulness and how much, uh, how much Christ is redeemed. And his, he's like, no, I, I see my own sin. He knows his past. He knows his present sense. And with that in mind, he lays out really a three-part perspective on how to live the Christian life that I want to spend the rest of our time looking at. This kind of three-part perspective. If you want to grow in maturity, if you want to uh, mature in Christian faith, there are three things. First, forget what lies behind. Second, keep the end in mind. Third, strain forward till we arrive. So forget what lies behind, keep the end in mind, strain forward till we arrive. That's what I want to spend the rest of our time looking at. So let's get that first part. Forget what lies behind. In verse 13, in verse 13 he says, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. So there's two types of forgetting that I think we should have. The first is forgetting the sins of our past. That if you belong to Christ, your sin has been paid for. Like, hear that. If you belong to Jesus, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. Your sin has been paid for. It is, it is forgotten. Like Colossians 2 gives the picture of he cancels the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. Like it's this, no, that's been paid for. That's been placed, like Jesus takes our sin on the cross. That means that all of your sin has been paid for. Blood has covered it. Christ dies in our place. We should be guilty for the wages of our sin is death. But Christ is the one that goes to the cross for us. And Paul understood that better than anyone. He knows his past. 
I mean, he, he persecuted Christians. He was a part of the mob that murdered Stephen in Acts 7. If anyone understands this, it's, it's him. He understands what it means for your past to actually have some real ghosts, some skeletons in your closet. He understands what it means for you to have a past. And he also knows and believes what God says through the prophet Isaiah. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. He understands who our God is. That for his people, he doesn't hold our sins against us. So you get to move on from it. You get to move forward, which is wonderful. Once a year, we, uh, we run uh, something called recovery. It's 10 weeks long. And if you ask anyone that's done it, it's 10 very long weeks. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And uh, it brings, it's, a, it's a process of understanding suffering and sin and brokenness and then experiencing the healing power of Christ. And uh, towards the end, where you start to see really Christ at work in the process, one of the things I emphasize is that, all right, you've, God's revealed some stuff. Like, y'all feel it. Like, he's revealed some stuff. He's shown some stuff that's happened. He's revealed some sin, some brokenness, some stuff from your past. And then Christ gets to work in it. And he gets to bring healing. And the gospel comes to bear in our lives in some beautiful ways. And then guess what? We get to move on. One of the things I say is, you get to move on from this. You don't have to be marked by this anymore. You don't have to have this narrative in your head that says, this is who I am. It's like, no, 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 no. No, no, no. This is who you are in Christ. So we get to move on. Because, I mean, I think in our culture right now, I think there's a lot of um, uh, currency and, and, and really own, like just being marked by the past, being marked by your brokenness. And as Christians, we get to say we, we, we understand the reality of our brokenness, but we also understand the reality of the gospel and this healing power, and we move on. And it's like, no, no, no. We're, we're not marked by who we were. I think that's one part of, of forgetting what lies behind is understanding that I'm not marked by my sin anymore. I think another part is that we're also, as we forget what lies behind, is we don't focus on the work that we've already done, meaning the, the ministry that we've already done, the good works in Christ that we've already done. The way she, we don't keep looking back, we look forward. I mean, that's what Jesus is getting at when he's teaching about discipleship. In the New Testament, in the, in the Gospels, in, in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, he says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And the picture there is an agricultural imagery is that if you're plowing a field, you plow in a straight line. You don't, you don't look back. If you look back, whether back then it's pulling the reins of an ox or if it's now, if it's tracking, you don't look back. You look back, you turn. And you veer off course. That's foolishness. It's an obvious thing. No, you, you, you look straight forward. And the, what he's getting at there is, is no, we, do, we look forward, not backwards. The, 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 the kingdom momentum is forward. It's not backward looking, not at all. We look forward to the day when Christ returns and establishes the new heavens, the new earth. We look forward. It's a forward-looking faith. And I think Christians, I think we struggle with this. Because I think if we're honest, I think sometimes we long for a season of old. We long for how things used to be. So, man, I just remember when it, was, when it was 50 people in the room and we're just worshiping Jesus and we all knew each other and we all knew each other's stories and it was intimate. And I just miss the days when I just knew everyone. Or I just, I, I, miss, the, I miss the days of old, I miss how worship used to be. What I used to have back in that season. All right, I missed our old community group. We multiply community groups for the sake of mission. We multiply groups to be able to create space for others to see and savor and know Christ. And then sometimes it's like, man, I just wish we could go back to my old group. I wish we'd go back. It's just us in the room together. We do this, fill in the blank. There's a lot of different ways where you, for all of us, we can just look back at, at, at stuff before and just, oh, just, I wish I could go back there. And it's like, no, the, we move forward. The, the, the end is better. We're moving that way. And I don't think that Paul is saying that the past is 100% irrelevant. 
I don't, I don't think he's saying that. I don't think he's making that argument. You can see in his other letters that he mentions things that have happened before. I think learning from mistakes is wise. I think that there are things you can learn from history in the past. But that's not the focus. The focus is forward-looking. The focus is this way, and it's not what lies behind. So, first thing is forget what lies behind. The second is keep the end in mind. In verse 12, he says, Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus made me his own. And he goes on to say, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straying forward to what lies ahead. I press on to the goal of, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That he's like, no, we, we keep the end in mind. The prize is what we're, we're, we're running towards. Like our, that's, why, that's why our six-year-old baseball players, that's why they came alive. They saw that prize. They saw a trophy half their size and said, we're going to give everything we got to win this. Do you all want to see how big this trophy was? You want me to get it for you so you can see it? Huh? Well, you have to ask Raz Bradley. <laughs> because we lost 16 to 18 in the most epic, dramatic fashion in the bottom of the last inning. And, I mean, it's Nate's trophy, but I'm sure it's in Raz's office. I'm sure he shows all of his clients and says, this is what, I mean, so you can take a look at it. But that, it just, this idea of, of seeing the prize and coming alive is, is, is more difficult for us because we actually can't see it. We, we, can't, we can't see what's ahead. We can see the work of our God, but our, we can't see our God. That's the part of faith here that makes this a little bit difficult. And it's trusting God and what he has for us and what he says and his word and what awaits us and believing that wholeheartedly. That, that that's what awaits us. And then trying to keep our mind there as much as possible because this life is difficult. It just is. I mean, some, some of us, you feel the physical pains of this life. You physically suffer. You feel the, the physical pain on a regular basis. And it's hard because that's all you did. I mean, that's such a present feeling that it's hard to actually realize that there is a day coming where you will have a glorified, resurrected body that does not feel pain, that does not feel the effects of suffering in this life. 1 Corinthians 15, 53, and, and picturing this is, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And it's this picture of something so much better that awaits us. I mean, there's so much uh, material emphasis on this body and this life. Billions of dollars and self-worth and all types of things put into the material here, now. And it's like, do you, do you see what's ahead and how that's better? We do this with a lot of things. Some of us feel the really difficult financial burdens of this life. And they're real and they're present and they don't seem to go away. It's like you get a pay raise and you're like, sweet. And you go to the grocery store and you're like, no. <laughs> there it went. I walk out with... 10 items for $100, and I'm like, what happened? The insurance went up 25%. What happened? And you just can't seem to get above the water, and you just feel like you're always treading, always trying to get above, and you can't ever quite make it, and you just feel tired because of it. And that can keep our, 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 fi our, our focus here. And God's like, no, 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 do you, do you see what's coming? There's a day coming where you don't have to worry about financial burdens anymore. Where God meets every single need and desire. I mean, the, the picture of Revelation 21 is a city where the gates are made of solid pearl. The streets are made of pure, of pure gold. That Christ is the light that lights up the city of God and the new heavens and the new earth. Every single possible need is met. 
So there's a day coming if we, if we see it and we keep our focus there. By faith, it's coming. And it's like, no, I don't have to worry because ultimately that's where I'm going. This happens with right now with relational difficulty. Sometimes you feel the relational difficulty that you have in this life. You feel it with, in marriage. You feel it with your children. You feel it with family. You feel it with friends. You feel it at work. You feel it in your group. And it's just, why is it so hard that I've just got this, I've got this brokenness here. I've got this person who's cut me out of their life. I've got this person that won't talk to me. I've got this person. I've got relational weirdness here. And it's like, I just, I just so badly want to get a, get a house in the country and see three people a year and never talk to anyone ever again. Because if I open myself up to any more hurt, I don't know if I can do it. And I just, our, 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 that's all we can see is the relation difficulty right here. And God's like, do you, do you see that one day there's a day coming where there's perfect harmony with one another? The dead in Christ are raised to life. And that life is beautiful. We're described as having, in Revelation 19, we're described as having uh, fine linen, bright and pure. The fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. It's the perfect righteousness that we finally get to lay hold of. There will be no more sin, no more strife. There will be people there. There's genuine Christians where you just, I mean, that you just didn't click with in this life because both of you have sin that just comes to the surface more naturally because of your personalities. And one day you'll see that person and you only know love. You only know perfect love with one another. That day is, is coming. I'll give you one more. In this life, we feel regular, consistent, crushed hope. Now, some of that's because we worship things in this world and we put our hope in this world and we have idols that we bow down to in this world that we should not. Our hope should be in Christ and Christ alone and we're just trying to find ultimate hope in created things. That is a reality. But sometimes there's just not hope that you've put everything in. So I wasn't worshiping wanting to get this job. I just generally, it was a good way to provide for my family and I didn't get it. I, said, I hope this outcome was going to work out different. I hope this person was going to reconcile. I hope that this was going I mean, there's just life is hard because it's one crushed hope after the next in a lot of ways. And you feel it over and over and over again. There is a day coming where there is no more crushed hope. There's only secure, eternal hope. Revelation 21 says, And I heard... A loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That's what awaits us. No more tears. No more suffering. No more pain. No more, no more crushed hope. Only secure, eternal hope. You can do this with every aspect of life where you feel fallenness and brokenness. And we feel that. But the problem is that we feel it so much that all we do is we look down. And we look what's right in front of us. And the gospel reminds us to pick, pick your head up and to see what awaits you. To see the God that awaits us. To see the reality that awaits us. And to see... That's worth, that's worth living for. Now, what this world has to offer is garbage by comparison. Now, I want, I want that. It's putting all of our hope there. And Paul says that in, in doing this, in his letter to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, he says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. He calls the sufferings of this present life. And him describing this is something because he is, this man has been tortured and beaten and spit upon and mocked and arrested in ways that none of us will ever experience. And he calls it light, momentary affliction. And it's like, are you serious? And it's like, by comparison to the eternal weight of glory that awaits us, it is. This 
life is brief. And it is, that the suffering we feel is momentary. But in those moments of suffering, as we believe the gospel, it is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. He goes on to say, as we look not to things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The unseen things that we are awaiting. The eternal hope beyond all comparison that awaits us. That's worth keeping so firmly fixed in our gaze that it informs every moment of how we live this life. And that's the last thing I want us to see. Strain forward till we arrive. Strain forward till we arrive. It says in verse 13, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So forgetting what lies behind and keeping the end in mind, it gives this imagery of straining for, pressing on towards. That the language of strain here in the original language is this idea of, 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 of stretching out, of, of straining to get through the end. It's like the imagery of a runner, of a sprinter, and a track meet. In track and in, in sprinting, uh, there's a few different races. Uh, I think the 400 meter is probably the most difficult of all the uh, sprint races in track and field. I, I, the 100 meter is, I mean, it's a dead, full-on sprint with every single ounce of energy, but it's only 100 meters. The 800 meter is two laps around the track. If you do what you do in the 100 meter, you won't win that race. It requires a lot more pacing. The 400 meter is one lap around the track, and that, it, it's not you got to have a little bit of pacing, like strategic pacing, but it is pretty much almost a dead sprint for 400 meters. I mean, if you ever watch a 400-meter race and watch them race it, it's impressive. And you watch a close one, it's, it's wild. I mean, because they are, for 400 meters, they are absolutely giving almost every single ounce of energy. They're not conserving hardly anything, and they're running full out. And when you see them get to the finish line after giving everything they can with just a tad bit of pacing to break through and strain through the finish line, it's impressive. And it's a picture of really the Christian life that we're called to do. It's something we should ask ourselves. Do I strain for the prize like that? Is that the picture of the Christian life? That sure, it's going to require a little bit of pacing. But it is max effort. It is going for it. Like, are we going to stand before God and testify that I strained to the finish line? That I gave, as, as Colossians 1 teaches, Colossians 1, 29 says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Knowing that it's not the power within us, it's not, the power doesn't come from us, it comes from the Holy Spirit, but tapping into the power of the Holy Spirit, we strain with every single ounce of energy that comes from Him towards the upper price. Is that the life that we live? Because that's the life that God calls us to. Which means, hear this, that means that everything that you do in this life matters. Every thing that you do in this life matters because it's tethered to and tied to eternity. I love what N.T. Wright, the theologian, says about the resurrection in his book, Surprised by Hope. I'm going to condense this quote down. It's a little bit longer, but he says, the point of the resurrection is that the present bodily life is not valueless just because it will die. What you do with your body in the present matters because God has a great future in store for it. What you do in the present by painting, preaching, singing, sewing, praying, teaching, building hospitals, digging wells, campaigning for justice, writing poems, caring for the needy, loving your neighbor as yourself, will last into God's future. These activities are not simply ways of making the present life a little less beastly, a little more bearable. 
they are part of what we call building for God's kingdom. Everything that you do in this life matters. It's not to make it a little less beastly and a little, more, a little less burdensome, a little more pleasurable time. It's not, no. Everything you do matters because it's tethered to an eternal reality, which means we do everything to the glory of God. We do everything with that end in mind. With all of his power that works within us, we strain towards that end. No matter what God calls us to do, we do it to the glory of God. Straining for the prize. A few years ago, I read this book. It's called The Gospel Comes to the House Key by Rosaria Butterfield. And that book has always been very convicting for me. She's teaching about hospitality. And God has get there with hospitality. It's evident when you read the book. But when she just describes a general week, it's just wild to me. I just like it. It's just kind of on Monday, you know, we've got, uh, you know, she homeschools and she has, uh, she fosters kids. She talks about some of the complexities that they had on Monday. And then these people come home. Her husband's a pastor. These people come from the church to her house and they spend some time together. Then on Tuesday, you know, they, they're, they're missional in their streets. So they invite people from their street to come over. Then Wednesday, uh, this family came over. Then Thursday, they ended up doing this. And then Friday, they opened their home up to this person who was hurting, this woman who was in an abusive situation. And then on Saturday, and then on Sunday, and I just read it and I'm like, what? But she gets it. She, she knows the prize. And everything she does to the glory of God, she will strain. And it's like I, 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 I read that. I'm like, that is a life worth living. And that should call us to be reflective of the lives that we live now. And we should respond. We, we should. Some of you should consider hosting your community group. Like you've seen how hard hosting a group can be. You've seen what happens when eight children come into a play area and just make it their own by murdering everything in sight. <laughs> and then you have to go in and you have to correct them and say, don't do this, respect the place. Ah, you've seen, you've seen what happens when like just all of a sudden there's spaghetti on the wall and it's like, how did that get there? And it's been there for days and who did it? But you should, you should. Some of you should consider leading a group, which is even harder because leading a group is not, it's not easy. But what a beautiful thing to give your life to. How many testimonies in our church of people who jumped into a community group who did not know Christ, but then came to see the gospel lived out in beautiful ways and place their faith in Christ that are one day going to be with him forever. You should consider it. Some of you should consider leader in training. You should consider becoming a leader in training. And, a, and, and that's an opportunity for you to grow. Yeah, it's going to require more of you. But you get to know more of Christ in it. You should strain. I mean, really strain to whatever God has in front of you. Some of you should consider finally becoming members. Some of you have been around for a bit. And it's like you, you should consider finally becoming a member. And, and, and submitting to the authority of one another in the local church. You, you should. So some of you should strain in whatever way God is calling you to. Some of you, that, that means giving yourself away to others. I mean, some of you should consistently and regularly share the gospel. Like, I mean, consistently and regularly in your workplace, share the gospel. And it's like, oh, I don't want to come off as preachy. I want to, you know, let them see it in my life. And it's like, well, the, the gospel is not a life, it's a message. And it's like they, they need to hear it. And it's like, who cares if you're, like, there's, a, there's a bad way of being preachy, the self-righteous preachy, and no, don't do that. Don't, I'm, but I know a lot of you, and you are not in danger of being that guy or that girl, okay? But who cares if you're known as being preachy? Every, let, me let, you, let me let you in a secret. Everyone is preachy. Everyone's preaching about something, Okay? This literally, if you ever worked in an office, they're preaching about the favorite show that they love. They're preaching about their children. They're preaching about whatever new thing that they're into, whatever new podcast they're into. Their cats. I mean, just everyone's excited about something, 
And they're an evangelist for something, they're going to tell you about it. And a lot of times what they're doing is they're, they're selling you on some type of hope that they found, and you, you know better. It's like, you know that, I mean, just being blunt and honest, that, that hope is stupid. It's just that hope is never going to satisfy and from a completely humble, non-condescending way, because the only way that we know that is by grace through faith, you lovingly and winsomely get to declare the mystery of Christ and compel them to a better hope. And so what if, a few, if you do it a few times and you get known as like, oh, they love Jesus, and if you go to lunch with them, then you might hear about it. Who cares? Everyone's preaching. We just have something better to preach about. You should strain. You should strain towards the prize. Growing in evangelism. We should do this. We should strain. Which means sometimes bearing burdens with difficult people. There's some people that could be described as clingy or dramatic or difficult or weird. And no one else in the world wants to give them any attention at all. And the most Christ-exalting God glorifying, obedient thing you can do is give them love and attention and focus and energy. Let me tell you something. If you do that, at some point, once you've won their ear, you can say, hey, did you know when you do this, that's really weird and off-putting? And, no, and like, there's a reason why like, people like, don't want to eat lunch with you. And the most like, Jesus-exalting, humble, wise way of saying it Hey, did you know when you get like really clingy, it's like, like you shouldn't? But again, like in the most gospel-centered, thoughtful, like wise way of approach. But you can do. But a lot of times, like, no, I've got to draw my boundaries here, and I've got to make sure that I'm taken care of. And it's like, yeah, you can take care of yourself. You can walk and chew gum as a Christian. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you can. You can get away like Jesus and know Christ and then strain to love others well as we press on towards that eternity. Some of you need to serve. Like you need to actually serve. And we make jokes all the time. And you should serve in Kid City. Because we have such a, yes, because we have such a need there. But you should. I mean, even if you're serving in another area, even if you're serving in hospitality or connected or any other area of the church, you put in one once a month, once every two months to Kid City, it totally changes the game. You, you can do both. Some of you are not serving. You should serve the church because we got a pile of children that, I mean, it just keeps growing. Like one of our big concerns in growing right now, we got parking. And so we got to figure out our parking situation. So some of you should park further away. But we also got a lot of kids. So we, we got to make more room for more children, which means we need to serve. Some of you should serve. Some of you should strain and missing out on the newest and nicest things in life. That means the newest and nicest vehicle. That means the, the, the greatest vacation. You might actually progress in a tax bracket that is above working class, but the way you live your life is working class because your extra money goes towards missions. It goes towards clothing orphans. It goes towards the local church because you understand that every single dime you make in this world ends up in the dirt. But the effort that you put into eternity lasts. And we should strain it towards that. Some of you should pray and, and, and receive the calling and aspire to missions, to pastoring, to church planning, to revitalizing, because that straining is worth it. We should strain. We should forget what lies behind we should keep the end in mind, and we should strain and press forward into eternity. And listen, that's exhausting at times. It is. That's long weeks and sometimes longer weekends and emotionally laden seasons, but the straining is worth it. Because one day in the eternal feast of God, there will be a table where there will be people right now in your life that did not know Christ. But because you decided to make it awkward one day, and you shared Christ with them. They're going to be at that table praising God and enjoying life with him for eternity. There will be people that nobody cared to love, that had a lot of burdens, that were doubting whether Jesus was good, but because you chose to love them and bear burdens with them and walk with them, even when it was difficult and even when they were difficult, they, in their perfected state, have no more burdens. 
and they'll be at that table rejoicing with the king. There is a day coming where people that you walk with that struggle with addiction, that struggle with pornography, that struggle with all types of sins that you got into the mess with and pouring them to Christ over and over again saw that put to death and it did not choke out the seed of faith, but they bore fruit because you leveraged your life for the mission of God. It is worth the straining with every ounce of energy within us that comes from God. Brothers and sisters, we forget the past. We keep the end in mind, and we strain towards that eternity. It's worth it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you might help us see this life as compelling and worthy of our lives. That, for some of us, means that we need to believe. There are some men who have not surrendered to you to live that life God, I pray that right now they would not delay, that they would lay down their life and surrender to you. They would see their past paid for on the cross, and they would see their future redefined as a new person in Christ. But God, that requires you breaking through their heart right now in faith, and I pray that you would. God, I pray that you'd help each of us, help us repent of the sin in our lives that keeps us from straining towards the prize of the upward call of life with you. And that we believe that is better and more compelling than anything in this life. In Jesus' name, amen. The band's going to come up and we're going to take communion. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body that was broken for you. And they took the cup of the new covenant. He said, this is my blood that was shed for you. That as often as you eat and drink this, you proclaim my death until I return. So for Christians, that's a reminder of what Christ did for us on the cross, but also what awaits us. So we come to the table in repentance and in worship, being reminded of the prize that we're straining for. If you're not a Christian, please do not take part in this, but surrender your life to him now and take part in Christ.